I watched hashtag poor things this morning. Creative art direction? Yes. Hated the rest. Why do so many movies made by men think the only route to female empowerment and agency is to become sexually liberated and get fucked and debased by a parade of men? Hashtag Oscars 2024. Not sure if hot take, but I felt like the baby brain bit in Poor Things was a metaphor for infantilization, especially towards disabled, neurodivergent women. All of Bella's neurodivergent traits are played for laughs. The joke is on her eccentric traits. The first time Max sees Bella, he says, what a retard. Poor Things is possibly the most ableist and problematic film, like, ever. I know, I know, I know. What am I doing talking about media? What sort of bait and switch is she gonna pull this time with poor things of all, um, things? Well, actually, no bait and switch this time. I'm literally just here to talk about poor things because I hate how much stupid discourse is being had by anti-sex, moral panicking, media illiterate Puritans. Okay, but the idea of an infant's brain inside a 30-year-old woman and all the men taking advantage of her was ick. And I guess you could consider this also my obligatory alarm call against the rising tide of fascism because fascists are inherently anti-sex, puritanical, media illiterate, moral panickers. So consider it relevant. Okay, so I'm assuming most of you have probably seen Poor Things, but if not, let me break it down. So Willem Dafoe is, for lack of a better term, a mad scientist who finds a dead pregnant woman who threw herself off a bridge. Oh, my research had come to this moment. Fate had brought me a dead body and a live infant. It was obvious. It was? Take the infant's brain out and put it in the full-grown woman. Reanimate her and watch. Jesus. He raises her like a daughter and brings in Rami Yosef to monitor her growth and development. Why are you pen book every nut? I must note down your nutritional intake. How many? Eventually, she discovers, as every child does, the experience of sexual pleasure. Bella discover happy when she wants. Next thing you know, she's running off on a cross-country sex affair with Mark Ruffalo, beautifully playing one of the most pathetic male characters in all of fiction. God! Bella, where were you? You disappeared. Nobody can just disappear. What? Can they? Disappear? No, of course not. What the fuck are you talking about? Where were you? Bella! And from here, Bella is kidnapped and whisked out to sea, discovers that poor people exist, gets robbed, becomes a prostitute and a socialist, gets kidnapped and held prisoner by a sadistic general, and eventually gets an arranged marriage and takes up her father's mantle as a mad scientist. This is a very uncharitable read of the story, and it sounds absolutely awful, right? That seems to be the interpretation that a lot of folks walked away with, and I'm here to tell you why they're wrong. Poor Things, starring Emma Stone, faces backlash for its strange and disturbing kitty porn plot. First things first, if you bring in the word and concept of when talking about poor things, then you've already missed everything. A film following a baby in a woman's body finding sexual liberation after being groomed and trafficked isn't quite what I pictured as a great critique on pedophilia, but okay. Does the movie advocate for pedophilia or not? Wrong question. Will reinforcing this project orientate more individuals to make more pedophilic art? This film is not about not even tangentially, and the insistence that it is just betrays a deep disrespect for and misunderstanding of children as a whole. Because here's the thing. Bella is not a child. I don't know if y'all know this about infants' brains, but they do this thing when time passes and they begin experiencing things. They grow and develop. And that is what this film is about. Despite its premise, Poor Things is not a horror story in the vein of Frankenstein. It's a coming-of-age fairy tale, a building's Roman, more in line with the novels of Austen, Bronte, and Dickens than the gothic horror of Shelley or the dark science fiction of H.G. Wells. It's true, Bella starts out as a baby, but she's only so briefly. God! God! Ah! Hello! Yo. <laughs> Bella, this is Mr. McCandles. Hello, Bella. No! Oh. Bud. Huh. Blood. Bud. Blood. Blood. I'm fine, I'm fine. The whole first part of the film shows her literally growing up, from infant to child to adolescent, under the watchful parental eye of God the Father, and the lessons and manners and conventions of polite society from her teacher, Max. Bella, cease working yourself immediately. <laughs> what? In polite society, that is not done. Uh... So as a child, she breaks free from her teacher's authority and goes to the roof, sees the outside world. Wanting to go outside and see what's out there, she tells God what she wants. Outside must go. Outside? No. Yes, out. 
Daddy says no, and she throws a tantrum, like a child does when they cannot communicate in a way that gets them what they want. Now. Hello. No! Her first romance with Max is very much the kind of relationship one has as a child, with other children. It's mostly based on time spent together, and while there may be some physical contact and hints of sensuality, it's not really a sexual thing. Feel funny. Um. Too Bella. When you're a kid, stolen kisses are a more meaningful relationship aspiration than actual sex is. And the marriage thing? Do you know how often kids play marry each other? Because kids are smarter than we give them credit for, and a part of them understands that marriage is a made-up thing, akin to an arbitrary game or performance. And that's what Bella's whole thing with Max is at first. I wish to marry you. Be my wife. Ah. Uh, let us touch each other's genital pieces. Uh, no, no. Do not wish to take advantage of you. But by the time she comes to God and her teacher to announce her plan to run away with the Hulk... Big news. Belly's dizzy with excite. Tonight, at midnight, I secretly run away with one Duncan Wedderburn. And notice, she asserts. She doesn't ask. You will wish to stop me. I shall stop you. You hold Bella too tight. I must set forth into waters. She's emotionally and intellectually on par with a person in their mid to late teens. When she is told no, she does not tantrum like a child. She uses her words and explains what she wants and why she wants it. Kiss me and set me forth. If you do not, Bella's insides shall turn rotten with hate. Hate? Hate. She even shows awareness and discernment that not a lot of us had at that age. She isn't being seduced by a deceptive scoundrel posing as a decent person whom she's falling in love with. She understands that he doesn't have her best interests at heart, but she still wants to go in order to experience the world. I shall adventure on Duncan Wedderburn, who I think has little of damage to me, but will be interesting as well. And very quickly, she learns what an absolutely pathetic loser this guy is. Go home, Duncan. Our time has ended. I look at you and feel nothing but the lingering question of how did I ever want you? Oh. So by the time she's bouncing on his dick, she's enough of an adult to be able to consent. And like, let's be real. How can anyone watch this and think that consent is somehow being breached here? Especially hers. Why do people not just do this all the time? I am fine. Now I must lie down and you must lie down on top of me and do more furious jumping. What of the tongue play? You are about to perform? Is that not happening? Oh, that's another thing the Puritans are saying, that this character is sexualized. I'd argue she actually isn't sexualized at all. I mean, she is very clearly established and depicted as a sexual being, obviously, but she's never sexually objectified. The thing about sex in Yorgos Lanthimos' films is that it's not sexy. It's an awkward mechanical thing, uncomfortable and unserious, too and often past the point of hilarity. In Lanthimos' films, sexuality is seldom used to titillate or excite the audience, and the sex in Poor Things is no different. <laughs> Bella is never sexually objectified by either the camera or the text. All of her sexual encounters are subjectively portrayed, shot with a framing and focus on one thing, whatever Bella is experiencing. Her sexual awakening, the first masturbation scene, is presented to us without eroticism. We see only her legs shot neutrally and her face. We aren't meant to be turned on by this. We're meant to gradually figure out what's going on here, reflecting Bella's own sense of discovery as she experiences the euphoria of an orgasm for the first time. When she's bouncing on the Hulk's dick, we focus on her face. The direction is not telling us to respond with, yeah, she's so fucking hot, but to respond with, aw, good for her. It's the same focus on Bella's subjectivity through her face when she experiences any new variety of pleasure. Eating something delicious, getting drunk, carving human flesh, hearing music that stirs her to tears, etc. This is a story of a girl growing up and exploring the world, seeking out pleasure and experience, as well as discomfort, pain, and suffering. Hey, boy. Like, her dis- Boy. See, her discomfort with her clientele at the brothel at first it's not violation. Should we warm me up a bit for- <gasps> uh, oh. This is not violation. It's just discomfort that she is consenting to in order to get what she wants. And honestly, if we're going to talk about the issue of sexual exploitation and poor things, let's look at Bella's perspective on her role as a sex worker. Oh, we are our own means of production. Go away. Yes, this is clearly someone who doesn't understand how they're being exploited. What a stupid sexy baby. Can I be real? What a very pretty heart. This 
is all of y'all looking at Bella Baxter and writing her off as a baby brain child in an adult's body. Is it the way she talks? I think it's the way she talks. Yes, at the beginning she can't say shit, but she develops the capabilities of language very, very fast. And like everything else about her attitudes and the way she conducts herself, her use of language is practical. She uses words in a way that communicates what she's trying to say to other people, regardless of whether her diction and syntax are proper. And contrary to what Duncan Dickbrain says, You're always reading now, Bella. You're losing some of your adorable way of speaking. No, she doesn't. I'm a changingable feast, as are all of we. While her command of words and language does improve as she reads and talks more, she never loses her focus on utility. She is direct and aims to communicate, not to please. And as an autistic adult, one who spent the whole of my inquisitive childhood saying the words and sentences that made adults uncomfortable and look at me weird, when all I wanted to do was understand how the world around me worked, I, I know I'm not the only neurodivergent girl who felt this watching Bella Baxter navigate the world. This movie is for the dolls. In the same way that the people in this world write Godwin off as a scary, ugly, mad scientist on the basis of his appearance, My face. People scared of God. Laugh at God. God lovely. We write Bella off for equally superficial and unsupported reasons. Bella is smarter than y'all give her credit for, and if I'm being totally honest, I actually think despite his weird and off-putting idiosyncrasies, Godwin is actually a pretty decent parent. For real, what does God do as a parent that's so reprehensible? People who want to say that Bella is being groomed, WRONG! No, she's not. Once again, y'all sound like Max when he's asking Godwin, Perhaps you were raising her to be your mistress. A dark thought unworthy of me, I know. So, you were not laying with her? And God replies that not only is he a eunuch, I am a eunuch and can't fuck her. To get a sexual response from my body would take the same amount of electricity as runs North London. But even if he could, he wouldn't because his fatherly feelings for her prevent him from seeing her as a sexual object. Sleep here. No. Folks, this character could be a whole lot scummier. Sure, you say, so he's not Leland Palmer, but that doesn't necessarily make him a good parent. Oh? He's patient with her when she is upset or throws a tantrum. He doesn't yell at her. He listens to her and validates her thoughts and feelings. Bella cut two. Just dead ones for Bella. Just dead. Just dead. He lets her hang out in the lab with him and participate in his work to the degree she's able. Squish! 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 <gasps> Formative positive experiences which remain with her long after his death. I am never happier than when I'm in here. When she says she wants to go outside, he accepts this and gives her what freedom he is able to while still keeping boundaries meant to keep her safe. Stop me walk! No! No now? No, never. Just no. Ah! Ah! Because when you have a child, you can't immediately give them full free reign to come and go as they please. You have to accompany them at first to teach them about the real risks and dangers of walking around in the external world. And even regarding her arranged marriage to Max, this interaction is telling. One condition. She must desire it also. I understand. There are two conditions then. For God, Bella's consent is a given. Duh, dude, if you want to marry her, she's got to actually want it. And for the entire rest of the film, she maintains this desire through her affair with DW, even to the point where Max assumes that the marriage was off because of how weird it would have been at the time. You've not mentioned our betrothal. <sighs> you were much younger. These are like two childhood sweethearts meeting again after many years and reflecting on their silly childish relationship and reevaluating it for the present day. Will you marry me, Max McCandless? I will. Whoa, ain't that wild? She was the one who asked him. But good father Godwin shocked even me when Bella announces her secret flight with this ruffian. You will wish to stop me. I shall stop you. You hold Bella too tight. I was expecting more resistance here as most of us would react if our 17 to 18 year old daughter was like, hey, mommy, daddy, I'm gonna run away and have adventures with this sexy older man I just met, bye. But when she insists that this is what she wants to do, he lets her go with money and his blessing because he recognizes her as an autonomous human being. Why did you not stop her? She is a being of free will. Really, as a parent, the most morally condemnable things he does are, well, first, to bring her into existence without her consent, but that's the case with anybody who produces children, and he lies to her about her origins when she's young, in the interest of protecting her from knowledge that she might not have been able to emotionally deal with. It's not all sunshine I bring. They also bring beady eyes and hard questions. Did I have a baby in me? And if so, where is it? 
yeah, it's not okay to lie to children, even if you're trying to protect them. And that's one of the many reasons why I refuse to ever be a parent, because it's kind of an unavoidable part of the job description. There are times when you have to be less than honest with your kids, and I couldn't bring myself to lie to a child like that. To me, the lies Godwin tells Bella about where she comes from are comparable to the lies we tell our kids when they ask what happened to Grandma after she died. We say she's in heaven now, and we'll see her again someday as opposed to, she's worm food and she's gone forever. Or when we want them to behave, instead of explaining why they should behave a particular way, we lie to them that a judgmental god or fat-bearded stalker in the Arctic has them under perpetual surveillance and will punish them if they don't behave a particular way. And even so, when she confronts him about it, he cops to his lie, he tells her the truth, and he validates her feelings of betrayal, and she accepts his apology while not unconditionally forgiving and forgetting. I am finding being alive fascinating, so I'll forgive you the act but always hate the lies and trapping that followed. Understood. I generally hate the connotations of this word, but I don't know how better to describe their parent-child relationship than wholesome. And this is quite deliberate on the filmmaker's part. How do I know this? Because I know Yorgos Lanthimos knows how evil and fucked up parents can be to their children. Let me tell you about a film called Dogtooth. <laughs> But first, remember when Comrade Bella said, You're whores! We are our own means of production. She means that as whores, they sell their bodies as a public commodity in order to generate profit. I actually think we need to reclaim the word whore, because the fact is, whoring doesn't just refer to the labor of sex workers, but all entertainers including me, and everyone else on this stupid video site. We are selling y'all our means of expressions, our personalities, our image, our stories, huge parts of ourselves by way of making content, be it artsy video essays, film reviews, or debate streams. We're making content of our very lives in order to make money. And this place is a fucking shark tank. For every successful left tuber like philosophy tube or contrapoints or empty signifier, there are hundreds if not thousands of very small YouTubers like me, whose channels and often very livelihoods are struggling to make it month to month. The big kids have their wannabe streaming giant Nebula, and at this point Nebula won't even look at you if you have less than 200,000 subscribers. And as YouTube tightens its copyright restrictions and community standards, those of us who specialize in making challenging, confrontational, and uncompromising videos are less and less able to make any money through AdSense monetization. And my videos have been getting demonetized left and right lately, in particular as I've used my platform to talk about Palestine and the ongoing Gaza Holocaust. Speaking of, please go check out and share around the documentaries I've been compiling that YouTube has been suppressing, By Bissan, 100 Days in Gaza, and The Gaza Diaries. Anyways, my channel doesn't take sponsors. Not that anyone's asked, but that's irrelevant. Everything I do here is only made possible by the support of my patrons over on Patreon, as well as various other one-time donors. See, currently I live in what I believe is now the second most expensive city in the United States, with a record high homeless population, and I'd like to get the hell out of here. So my lease runs out this summer, and me and mine need to go somewhere cheaper and hopefully perhaps a bit safer too, as safe as is possible in this country. These are very dark times, folks. And in coming months especially, the world is going to turn upside down. And while I am ready for revolution, I'm very scared. I don't want to have to be homeless again, especially in a time when our fascist police state is literally making it illegal to be homeless. So, anything anybody can spare would be deeply appreciated. Like Comrade Bella, I am a whore, performing for you and entertaining you in hopes that you'll have something to give. Oh, and if you need any extra incentive to join my Patreon, I've just launched the Strange Butterfly House Discord community server that patrons get access to, and I'm finna do some fun and interesting things with that soon. Anyways, all links are down the doobly-doo, and this ad is over. Lanthimos' first film, Dogtooth, is almost a complete inversion of Poor Things, as an unconventional family slash coming-of-age story. Dogtooth takes place entirely in a single compound, the home of an otherwise pretty average normal dude. There is no mad science here, no hideously scarred or deformed eccentric, just what a lot of people imagine a typical nuclear family to be. Mama, puedo no tu teléfono, para calor with one very strange exception. The man's children are full-grown adults in their 20s and 30s, but as we quickly learn, they have been kept in a state of arrested development by their pathologically controlling parents. I have 
Ο αδερφός σας αναδεικνύεται ξανά, νίκητης. These are adult children. Their development as human beings have been meticulously and deliberately stunted by their father to keep them imprisoned in the compound, where he and his wife can control every single aspect of their existence. Contrast this with the way Godwin raises Bella. Her development as a human being is literally the entire purpose of God's experiment. Yes, he does keep her confined to his estate at first, but the moment Bella expresses a desire to see and experience the outside world, he allows her to leave. Why did you not stop her? She is a being of free will. Meanwhile, father keeps his children ignorant and afraid of the outside world, or rather the fantasies he's constructed in their minds of what the outside world is like. For example, he teaches them that uh, cats are the most fearsome animal of all, and even how to repel them. <coughs> he also teaches them that children are only ready to leave the house when their dog tooth falls out. <laughs> Referring to their adult canine teeth, which, as we all know, are permanent teeth and don't ever fall out on their own. The siblings are routinely brainwashed with words of the day, which teach them that potentially intellectually and spiritually liberating words like see, pussy, and zombie Signify tame and quotidian objects that would not stir their imagination or critical thinking skills. Thalassa είναι η δερμάτινη πολυθρόνα με τα ξύλινα μπράτσα, σαν αυτή που έχουμε στο σαλόνι. Μουνί είναι η μεγάλη λάμπα. Παράδειγμα. Contrast this with the way Bella's linguistic development is depicted. She, she gathers 15 words a day. Also, I want to note the interesting substitution of the passive verb learn with the active verb collect. An interesting little touch I liked. Truly, anyone who watches Poor Things and considers Bella to be an exploited adult child unequipped to make her own decisions, I'd strongly recommend you try watching Dogtooth to see what exploited adult children unequipped to make their own decisions actually look like. Not that the Puritans would make it very far in Dogtooth, cause y'all are the kind of reactionary viewers whose hearts flutter and protest at depictions of enthusiastically consensual sex, and I'm pretty sure the sex in Dogtooth would make y'all croak. Bella discovers her capacity for sexual pleasure without interference, through masturbation. But in Dogtooth, masturbation is implicitly forbidden, as father hires a security guard at his workplace to periodically come to the compound and have sex with the son to fulfill that role. Like the general in Poor Things, father subscribes to the patriarchal belief that the sexual urges of men are privileged above those of women, and must be catered to. You see, a man spends his life wrangling his sexual compulsions. It's a curse, and yet in some ways, his life's work. But this ignorance and disregard of female sexual pleasure backfires when the son refuses to go down on Christina, characteristic of a child who is only concerned for their own satisfaction. Yes, folks, I'm telling y'all that it's selfish and childish not to reciprocate oral sex. Lick that clit and suck that dick. So Christina starts visiting Bruce and offers her rewards in exchange for cunnilingus. She exchanges a headband that glows in the dark, hair gel, stuff that would appeal to an overly sheltered child. Είναι ζελέ για τα μαλλιά. Το βάζει τα μαλλιά σου και τα κάνει όπω θε. Δεν μ' αρέσει. Αν θε να σε γλύψω, πρέπει να μου φέρει κάτι άλλο. Καλύτερο. But children eventually get bored of such trivial toys and trinkets, which leads to Christina giving Bruce something she's never experienced before films. So, why am I calling the eldest daughter Bruce? Well, because after she watches these movies in secret, in addition to being creatively inspired, quoting lines and reenacting scenes from Rocky, Jaws, and Flashdance, she asks her sister to call her Bruce choosing the name of the shark in Jaws. It's really fucking cute, actually, and it really resonated with me as a trans woman who chose her own name. Anyways, Bruce is caught with these tapes and punished, Christina is attacked and basically fired by father in retribution, and this precedes the most fucked up part of Dogtooth. So, people gave poor things hell for that scene with the father fucking Bella in front of his sons to teach them about sex. It doesn't advocate for pedophilia, but the scene of the kids getting sex education from their dad fucking Emma Stone was weird as fuck. But 
In all seriousness, I would defend this scene, and to a degree, this method of sexual education. Yes, okay, it's very weird, socially unacceptable, and for many people, difficult and supremely uncomfortable to watch. But like, contrast this with the common, more disturbing, and somehow more socially acceptable trope of a father hiring sex workers to fuck their sons to make them men. Like, I was horrified when this scene began, because the conventions of patriarchy and fiction have set an expectation for what that is gonna happen here. I legit thought he was gonna try to have Bella fuck his sons to teach them about sex. You wish what? My boys are orphanage for education, sexual. Thankfully though, this was not the case, and my expectations were completely subverted. I will demonstrate. I see. And, I don't know, I find this scene strangely charming, not to mention hilarious. Si ça ne vient pas, père. Do you aid things along a finger in the arse? No. Or a slight no. choking may do it. <laughs> What do you think this experience does for these kids? They're learning about how sex works without the puritanical moral stigma characterizing much of our sex ed in the present day, instruction that they seem to be attentive and receptive to. And Bella even gets into the spirit of education and gives tips on how to make sex more pleasurable for both parties, like fingering the guy's ass and lightly choking him. Finger your men more. They love it. And framing this scene in terms of the effect it has on these children, I have a hard time seeing how this causes them any harm. At least any more harm than help. I bet their future sexual partners are going to be pretty pleased that they know about things like foreplay, butt stuff, and light S&M compared to their peers. <laughs> Seriously, like, in all sincerity, I'd argue that this is more effective and less harmful sex ed than abstinence-only bullshit that most of this country is taught in the 21st century. Meanwhile, back in Dogtooth, once his son's sex doll is fired, Father determines that no one from the outside can ever step foot in the compound again, and to fill that role for his son's sexual maintenance... Yeah... Yeah... He's made to choose between his sisters, and he picks Bruce, and they're forced to have sex at their father's behest. It's really disturbing, and really fucked the fuck up, and it's a hundred times more upsetting than this scene in Poor Things. I mean, anything in Poor Things, really. However, I will say that not all of the sex in Dogtooth is this fucked up. Granted, it's all a bit uncomfortable, but much of that is due to our own cultural understandings of sexual mores and taboos. Through Christina, Bruce learns about the morally neutral, transactional nature of sexual pleasure. Like the sex Bella has in the brothel, Bruce's sex with Christina is utilitarian, a means to an end of getting something she wants, unaffected by the oppressive conventions of sexual morality. <laughs> Afterwards, Bruce explores her own capacity for pleasure by exchanging the sparkling headband with her sister in exchange for her licking her shoulder. And this reminded me of Bella licking Max's ear and asking him to lick hers back and poor things. I'm too Bella. When it comes to children exploring their sexuality with other children, this is often what it looks like. Like I said, as far as intimacy between children goes, small touches and gentle sensuality are generally what's par for the course. You gotta learn to walk before you can run. And this sexual experimentation comes back around when Bruce's sister asks to lick her again, even though she doesn't have anything to trade for it. Yes, folks, I know they're sisters, I know this is incestuous, I know it's pretty gross to most people, but there is something special and even kind of sweet about this scene. <laughs> this is both sisters' discovery of sex as a means of pleasure rather than just transaction. And guess what, my dear strangers? This is fully consensual. The sister is doing this not because she wants something in exchange, but just because she wants to, and Bruce accepts it just because she wants it. Like, there's even some communication here regarding what feels good and what doesn't. I know actual real-life adults who aren't able to communicate like this in bed. I've known guys who think their girlfriends are bad at blowjobs because they won't just fucking tell them when they're using too much teeth. Likewise, I've known lots of women whose partners can't make them come because they do not tell or show them how to get them off. Unsolicited but useful sex advice? Whatever your gender, if you aren't satisfied during sex, that's on you. Your orgasm is your responsibility. Your partner or partners cannot give you what you want and can't fuck you like you want to be fucked if you don't communicate with and teach them how to. Honestly, the most fascinating and impressive thing about Bruce and her siblings is how much they are able to communicate what they feel and want, despite the limitations imposed on them by their tyrannical father. Anyways, Bruce's story in Dogtooth is ultimately about her finding and exercising her own agency, by smashing her Dogtooth to prove herself ready to leave the compound. Meanwhile, in Poor Things, the mere reversal of Dogtooth, 
All Bella has to do is ask her father, invoking the love that they share, and he sets her free. Kiss me and set me forth. If you do not, Bella's insides shall turn rotten with hate. Hate? Hate. That's poor things. Don't know how to really end this video because I wrote it on impulse because I was mad at the internet. But basically, I hope I've well demonstrated that the Puritans are wrong about poor things being about pedophilia or child or grooming or any stupid shit like that. Okay, guess what? I figured it out. I figured out what serious real-world relevant thing I should use poor things to rant about. You don't know the world, and you fear it. I do not fear it. Do you want to see what the world is really like? I'll show you. Yes. Because the sex stuff is far from the most integral or interesting part of poor things. Did you hear that? What is it? So tell me, what exactly are the titular poor things? A lot of dead babies. We must go help them. How will we do that? I saw this scene get some flack, but I think both Bella's coming of age and the film itself revolves around what she learns here from Harry, played by Bo Burnham's boyfriend, Jared Carmichael. For the first half of Bella's journey, her childhood, adolescence, and early adulthood, she is driven by self-centered physical pleasure. But when Duncan whisks her away to sea, Bella is driven to seek different kinds of pleasures. No interesting older lady. I must touch your hair. I also noticed your hair, just like silk on a translucent, glowing egg. That is fancy words that excite me somehow. And so she makes her first adult friends. I have made friends, colleagues, comrades, Martha, an idealist. People and society can be improved. It is the goal of all to improve, advance, progress, grow. I know this in me, and I'm sure I am indicative of all. And Harry, a dashing gay cynic. This improvement through philosophy is people trying to run away from the fact that we are all cruel beasts, born that way, die that way who introduced her to philosophy, setting her on the pursuit of intellectual pleasures. And these two are fighting, and ideas are banging around in Bella's head and heart like lights in a storm. But it's through her intellectual affair with J.C. the Cynic that Bella is first radicalized, when he shows her the brutal reality of poverty and slavery and oppression. A lot of dead babies. Oh. Must be hot. Who am I, lying in a feather bed? Well, dead babies. Lion ditch. <laughs> and it's here that Bella decides what her purpose for being alive is. If I know the world, I can improve it. Which leads her into the loving arms of Toinette, a fellow sex worker who introduces her to the ideology of socialism. Je suis socialiste. Read. What is that? Une personne qui veut change the world pour le meilleur. Make it better. A better world. And I am that too. Now, one of the few valid criticisms of Poor Things is that the black characters in the story are only really there to aid and enable the development of the white protagonist. It is only the way it is until we discover the new way it is, and then that is the way it is until we discover the new way it is, and so it goes until the world is no longer flat, electricity lights the night, and shoes are no longer tied with ribbons. Je suis d'accord. As a socialist, I agree entirely. That's fair. Granted, I'm, I'm not the one to talk at length about this, I just kind of wanted to acknowledge it because it's there, um, and I wouldn't blame anyone for taking issue. Although I will say, this aspect of Bella's story really resonated with me as a politically radical white femme doll who owes her own political liberation class consciousness to the work and inspiration of queer black sex workers and Afro-pessimist philosophers. And we must go to the meeting of socialists. Your horse! We are our own means of production. Anyway, as for the poor things of the title. A lot of dead babies. We must go help them. How will we do that? Well, that's the point of this scene. And I know this line was written before the Gaza Holocaust started, but still, I feel it in my bones. A lot of dead babies. Oh. The poor things are the children, the young, the disabled, the wretched of the earth. And the point of the story is that we need to treat children and young people, the most vulnerable and marginalized of humankind, like actual human beings, instead of these fetishized commodities our society has made of them. I am not sorry. If I know the world, I can improve it. You can't. We are a fucked species. Know it. Hope is smashable. Realism is not. 
Protect yourself with the truth. I realize what you are now, Harry. Just a broken little boy who cannot bear the pain of the world. I suppose so. Thanks for watching. Remember, no gods, no masters. All cops are bastards. Wear a mask and free Palestine. Have a strange night. Did you fuck that guy with hooks or hands? You did, I know! I beat the tar out of that guy! <laughs>